It's the song of the redeemed rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a love song born of a grateful choir. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, He reigns, He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, He reigns, He reigns. Let it rise above the four winds, caught up in the heavenly sound. Let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. It's all God's children. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we come to you, we thank you for who you are. Lord, as we come, we just do recognize that you reign. You are the God of, of heaven and earth. You are our loving, loving, loving Father. But you are in control, even in those moments and those times. It doesn't seem like there's any control at all or in the midst of chaos. And right now, Lord, I do want to lift up places that that are hurting places that are chaos and yet i know god you are there because you are more powerful than any hurricane so i pray for the folks in new orleans and and the surrounding areas in each one of those states and lord protect them and the the strength of your storm is coming but lord your protection is stronger and so i ask for that and then lord i also pray for just the situation in Afghanistan. I pray for the families who have lost loved ones. Lord, I, I thank you for those who serve in the military, for those who have put their lives on the line. And, and Lord, I pray for those families who have lost one now. And Lord, I pray that somehow, some way in your mightiness, those people who are left behind, left in Afghanistan, that they can seek you 
and that in the midst of, of what they face, they reach out to you. And Lord, I know, at least right now, that might even cost them their life. But Lord, give them the strength because you are so much more, so much more of a hope, so much more of, of life than anything else. And Lord, I just ask that you are with us this morning. May your Holy Spirit be with us and may, may we worship you through spirit. And Lord, I pray not just for our congregation, but every congregation in this community and in this nation and in this world, be lifting you up, Lord, your name, because you reign, you are holy. Lord, help us to worship you. In your name I pray, amen. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you. Let's uh, go ahead. We've got a few things to bring up in the program, and I've got to put my glasses down. Here we go. The uh, sock collection, we're continuing to collect socks. Uh, before today, we were at about 450. Our goal's uh, around 650. And I know more socks come in today. Matter of fact, I got baskets completely full again. So thank you for everybody that's bringing in those socks. And uh, we'll let you know. We'll probably collect one more week. Uh, but it looks like we're getting closer. We're probably within 100 pair now, I'm just guessing, uh, within 100 pair of hitting our goal. So thank you again, everybody who's bringing them in. Uh, also, just a reminder, th this being the fifth Sunday, we do have child care for our youngest group, toddlers, preschoolers, that age group, kindergartners, uh, but grade school will stay with us today here in the service. Uh, next series will be starting in two weeks, and that series is How Can I Share Christ in a Practical and Impactful Way? And if you've had somebody share Christ with you and you'd like to share that story, please get a hold of me. Uh, we, we will get the message out. I know some folks may want to share that testimony, and that's great. Someone may want to share it with me, and then I can share uh, that. And, and just the idea of that, that's going to be what that four-week series is about, is how we do that. Uh, we got some Bible studies coming up this Friday, September 3rd, 6.30, here at the church. It's our monthly Bible study, uh, continuing at end times. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, talk to Cody uh, as he leads that study. Uh, and normally, if you get a chance, just throw some food together to share and come. It is a great time of fellowship. It is a great time of study, uh, of studying God's Word. So that is this Friday, 630. I cannot believe it's going to be September already, but it will be. Also, September 8th, we're going to be starting back up with men's Bible study. We will be in the book of James, and we'll be studying the book of James so that is Wednesday, September 8th at 6.30 here at the church. We generally have some food to eat and uh, fellowship again, and again, great study time. Then September 11th at 4 p.m., we'll be at Brandon and Kathy's house, uh, just having a fun time together, cookout, games, things like that. If you want to know how to find Brandon and Kathy, is it okay to put the address in next week? Okay, that they're sitting here, so I'm going to... We've never thought about that before, but yeah, they're at their new home, and so we'll have the address in, and, and this should be a great time. And then also, Saturday, September 18th, Illumination uh, Music Concert. Uh, that's, there's more information. You can hit a website. There are signs around. Uh, that's at the Dark County Fairgrounds, uh, September 18th. There may be several of us going, and we can sit together if we want. Uh, I know we used to do like the block seating, the, the most expensive seating or second most expensive seating. Then we sit there and really be hot or it'd be raining and we'd look up to the folks who had the cheap seats and they were in the shade or they were out of the rain. They were out of the sun glaring at us as, as dusk happens and it's like, that's pretty cool. The folks who have the cheap seats have the best seats. So we just have the, we will just go and, and, um, and go and gather together. A couple more things on the back. Just want to mention uh, our tithes and offerings, and we have online giving. If you that would interest you to do online giving, uh, see Eric or Russ, and they can help you get set up with that. And I was just thinking and, and about that, that, and we're going to have a prayer for these outreaches. But also, you know, we don't pass a plate. We just have an offering box back there. But the giving, the offering, financial offering, is, is as important as all the other giving, the giving of prayer, the giving of time. And so as we pray, I'm just going to pray for that offering and, and for the folks who give that. Lord, as we come, Lord, I just ask that you are with us here with the Bible studies that are coming up. I thank you that 
we live in a country, we live in an area that we can openly study your word together. And so, Lord, may we not take that for granted, but may we look forward to it. And may the studies that are coming up may just be your spirit leading and that we can grow and that we can dig deeper into our spiritual lives and we can come closer to you. Lord, for the outreaches, the socks and things like that, I thank you that we have the opportunity to just be part of your hands and feet. And I thank you for all the missions, but especially lifting up a Naomi's heart mission and that these socks are just a small part of their ministering to children and young adults who are coming to know you as Lord and Savior and are becoming strong Christ followers, Lord. And I thank you, you invite us into that movement. Lord, I just thank you that the tithes and offerings, the financial gifts that come in, I thank you for those. I thank you for the givers, those who, who give and just sacrifice you know, just a portion of, of what you've given us, and that's really what it is, that we just give back to you a portion of what you've given us. And Lord, I just pray that every dollar that is spent is spent to glorify you, whether it is keeping the lights on, whether it is helping with the shipping for the socks, whatever, Lord, may it honor you. Lord, I just ask that your spirit is with us, and we'll be pausing here and, and saying hi to one another and coming back for worship. Lord, may this all be led by your spirit. In your name I pray, amen. Good. There's more snacks, I'm sure. Get up, say hi to one another. Folks online, this is a great chance to say hi to one another and hug each other in the family. And if, if someone is still in bed, this is a great opportunity to go, hey, wake up. Then we'll come back for more worship.
darkness, I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore.
Father, we come to you now. We just ask to feel your love all around us. No matter where we are, physically, spiritually, you know, just wherever we're at in our lives, we just know that, that you're there and your love surrounds us. Let us take that strength and that courage and just that faith that it takes to, to move on with our lives and, and continue just praising you every day and, and showing everyone your great love. We just ask that you be here this morning with Heath as he delivers your word and be in each and every one of us as we take it in. And, and just take lessons from it for our own lives and what we need to put into action and to see those in need and, and help them who need your love. We ask this in your heavenly name. Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone, again. Beautiful. Thank you, worship team, for your, your witness to us this morning. Dave took my joke, beginning with announcements. It is, can you believe September? Cody, September already? I know you're excited for September. 
So we're going to get started here this morning real quick by, as I said, the second to the last part of our series here, Summer Visiting with Friends. Today we're going to talk about the, about the, uh, the author of a couple of, of, of books in the New Testament, by the name, a gentleman by the name of Luke. And I want to start us off here with a real quick kind of a thought-provoking question. What would it be like to witness extraordinary events? Maybe we have read ourselves stories of, of those, of people who have witnessed these type of events. Maybe they were uh, in magazines or books or documentaries on television to see what it would be like to stand as these events un uh, unfolded. And most of these times, that these people are just ordinary people that saw and witnessed these events. So today, I'm going to give you three examples here are three names for you. Wilmer McLean, John T. Daniels, and Donald Stratton. These people we'll talk about later in the service and here in the message, but hold on to those three names for now. And we'll kind of explain to them later what events they saw. But as we visit with Luke today, the two books that he wrote, the Gospel book of Luke, that's today's dumb moment, and then second of all, he wrote the book Acts of the Apostles. We don't know much about Luke. We don't know about who his mom and dad are or who his brothers and sisters really are. We do know, however, he was of Greek descent and he was a physician. He was one of the first physicians out there. So Luke was a very highly educated individual. He was very thorough in his writings and we're not going to do him justice much today. We're just going to visit with him briefly and kind of give you an overview of what Luke was looking at. So we're going to start off by hitting the verses in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This is the NIV version. And this will kind of go ahead and get us rolling on what Luke was looking at. So verse 1, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis, so that you may know the certainty of the thing that you have been taught. There was a book written about 20, 25 years ago. Some of you may have written it. It was called The Case for Christ. Did anybody read that book? If you haven't, I would highly recommend you take a peek and read it. It's an excellent book. It's written by a gentleman by the name of Lee Strobel. Now, Lee was an interesting individual. He was highly educated. He had a bachelor's degree in communications. He was also had a law degree. This guy had it all from a standpoint of educational knowledge. He was also an atheist. And in the early 80s, Lee Strobel came to know Christ through his wife. Sometime, and he became a teaching pastor. And he started doing, a, and, and in, his, in his life before he became a teaching pastor, he was an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune and ABC News. He took it upon himself in the mid-90s to learn and understand what the case for Christ, what he is. So he interviewed a lot of people. He interviewed Bible scholars. He interviewed theologians. He interviewed pastors. He interviewed ordinary people just like you and me about their relationship with Christ. And he came to the conclusion that, yes, there was a Christ. We'll blow the spoiler alert for you. But he's also written so many other books past that that he did so in-depth investigations about the Christian life and, and, and what it means to be a Christ follower. Luke did the same thing. You look at those verses in the first four verses, you look at the words that he used. Verse 2, he talks about the eyewitnesses of the servants of the word. Those could have been disciples. Those could have been just ordinary people. If he looks at verse 3, he takes it upon himself. It says that I myself have carefully invest investigated everything from the beginning. And he wrote it in an orderly account to give clarity in Luke's word. And his word that he used was certainty. 
certainty that Jesus Christ walked on this earth. Now, we have no idea who Luke talked to. And I sat here and I thought about, can you imagine who Luke interviewed in this? I mean, everybody knows a good storyteller. This afternoon, I'm going to a visitation for a a gentleman I worked part-time with at the funeral home in Brookville. His name was George Tucker. And George was part of a group of two other guys. There were three of them. We called them the Three Stooges. There was George, there was Chelsea, and there was Terry. Lord help us all if all three got together and started talking and telling stories. Because the stories got bigger and more bigger and more expansive. And I remember once, Chelsea was a very good athlete in Brookville. He told a story that he hit the longest home run at Brookville, Brookville's baseball field. It went 480 feet, dead center field. George goes, I was at that game. I was about 10 years old. Chelsea, that ball landed about halfway over the center field fence, and it rolled down the hill because it was on a hill. It went 480 feet because it rolled 120 extra. (laughs) It was just stories that they told together about sports, about life in Brookville. Fish stories, golf stories, they were all there. They were hilarious. So I can't imagine Luke, you know, sitting there and getting all these stories from people. I can imagine him sitting in a, this is kind of off the grid here, He's sitting in a coffee shop in downtown Philippi. He's got his chai tea latte with extra whipped cream. And some guy shows up and tells him a story about how I was with Jesus. And there was this big group of people, and they had to cut a hole in a, in a roof and lower somebody in. You can imagine Luke going, yeah, that story's not true. He goes over maybe to a disciple and says, hey, you know, someone just told me the story about this guy get lowered, Jesus healed him, and it was, the disciple goes, yeah, it's true. So Luke had to carefully understand what a true story was, and maybe what, maybe a little bit of a fish story involved. But his writings are very organized, they're very detailed, and he was so detailed, there are stories and parables in Luke that aren't in any other gospel. I believe scholars have said there's 23 different parables. So we know Luke had had great conversations. And he carefully constructed the life of Jesus in that written form by interviewing those witnesses. As he was done with Luke, he started writing the book of Acts. We're going, to shoot, or we're going to shoot over to Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. We're going to read a little bit about what the beginning of Acts and the stories and the witnesses that Luke had from here. He's in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In my former book, Theopolis, now quick, I've, I've, I missed this on the second one, on the first, I'll get it on the second one. Theopolis actually... It was written to an individual, but if you look at the, at the meaning of Theopolis, it really means friend of God. So we're not, I'm, I'm sure it's a specific individual, um, but it is a friend of, it's a friend of God is what the name means. So it says, in my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was still alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you going at this time to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So in Luke, is starting in the first couple verses there of Acts. To lead you to tell you what this book is going to be about and telling the story after the time of that Jesus had left them not very much after not much pretty much quickly after that 
Luke tells the story of the, of the Holy Spirit coming in the day of Pentecost. And in this book of Acts, Luke is describing the call of Jesus to disciples. Now, here's a very interesting little theory. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 is what we call the Great Commission. And literally it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem to Judea and to the ends of the earth. If you look at it, there's a Bible scholar had written the following. He says, if you look at the book of Acts, the first part of Acts, the first third, focuses on disciples' works in and around Jerusalem. The second part discusses the outer parts being Judea and Samaria. And in the lightest third, the end of Acts is the ends of the earth. Luke took verse 8 and told stories of the witnesses of the disciples. Of those three, of those three great, of that third great, of those, excuse me, the Great Commission, the thirds that he broke down, doing the local work, doing the regional work, doing the ends of the earth. And the neat thing about Acts at the end of it, in the 28th chapter, there is no ending. You read a lot of these New Testaments. Paul was very good at saying, hey, this is who's with me, this is going to greet, these are who are greeting me, and blessings to all of you, amen. In the, 20, in the chapter 28, Acts is an open-ended book. Luke recognized the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the disciples didn't end at the end of the 28th chapter. It is still continuing today. Us as disciples and Christ followers, that we are to continue the story of the Acts that Luke has started for us so many years ago. Not only did Luke was was doing something of of investigating, Luke was able to then become a part of the story. We look at verse, uh, in Acts 16, in your program it says verse 1. It doesn't, it's actually verse 11. I guess I fat fingered that for us. The idea of is that is one of the first times that Luke uses the word we. Luke is now a part working with Paul. I believe the verse says, we started sailing to Troas city. So that is starting to become Luke as a witness to Paul's ministry. Later in Acts, we visit with, he was part of the group that visited with Lydia that Dave talked about a, a few weeks ago. We even get deeper into Acts in, in 21 You'll notice that Luke has been visiting with James, the older sibling Dave talked about last week. As you can tell, some of these people are starting to get a little bit cross. They're starting to be together. So when Luke was getting all of his stories and getting witnesses from others, he's really beginning to intertwine himself and getting these testimonies and learning, learning more about who Jesus was. And on top of that, being a part of Paul's ministry and seeing the great things that Paul had done. In Acts 27, Luke is actually with Paul in the prisoner ship that wrecks. And he is actually one of the, he is a survivor, he's one of the survivors of the shipwreck. So Luke has seen a lot of what Paul has done in his teaching in presenting to to others, presenting to the Gentiles, presenting to Romans, presenting to Greeks. And not only is Paul becoming, it's not only is Luke becoming a witness to Paul's ministry, he's becoming a trusted and loyal companion with Paul. As I mentioned before, Paul liked to end his story, end his letters with greetings. Several times Luke is mentioned. He's mentioned as the good doctor or a fellow worker. In one poignant ending in 1 Timothy, Paul is facing his greatest trial. He knows he's going to get martyred. He knows his time on earth is going to be short. And Luke is listed in verse 16 as the only person with him. It literally says Luke is the only one with him. Luke was a trusted friend, a trusted companion to to those. He was at the end of at the end of Paul's life. 
So what can we learn from Luke in his life? We can look from the following. Luke was filled with the Holy Spirit in his writings. Luke knew and understood that these stories were important. And then they needed to be scribed in a way that he was led to, to write these books. And then on later, on later on was able to witness some of these extraordinary events. Luke was a trusted and loyal friend to those. And for being a man of, of high stature and high education, it's really determining that he really did not have an ego. He was extremely humble in his writing. He wasn't somebody who was using the words I a whole lot or I did this or I did that. It was others that he presented himself to. He was able to tell the stories and witness some very extraordinary events. So the three people I mentioned at the beginning, if you haven't looked them up on Google here the last 15 minutes or so, we're going to tell you those three stories of some just ordinary people witnessing some very extraordinary events. Wilmer McLean was a wholesale grocer from Richmond, Virginia. Because of the busyness of the city of Richmond, McLean decided to move his family to a farm about 100 miles west of the city. One morning, he received a knock at the door from a friend who asked if he could provide a place for a meeting. After looking at a couple of options, McLean readily agreed to use his parlor. That afternoon, in Wilmer McLean's parlor on April 9, 1865, General Robert Lee and General Ulysses S. Grant met to discuss terms to end the Civil War. McLean was a witness to history. James T. Daniels was a crewman at the United States Life Saving Station. These stations were located on the coast of the United States to assist those in shipwrecks and other marine accidents. These stations later became the United States Coast Guard stations. Daniels was assigned to the crew at Kill Devil Hills in North Carolina. On December 17, 1903, Daniels was selected with other crew members to assist two brothers from Dayton, Ohio, to attempt the first man motorized flight. His job was to take the picture of the vent, even though he had never used a camera before. I was so excited to see the machine fly through the air, I do not remember squeezing the shutter, said Daniels. The picture he took was the only one that was viewable. The picture you see above, the most iconic picture of the Wright brothers' first flight. Donald Stratton was an 18-year-old Nebraska farm boy when he enlisted in the United States Navy. After basic training and a couple other stops, he was stationed at a small naval base outside of Honolulu, Hawaii. On December 7, 1941, he was on the deck of the USS Arizona as the Japanese bombers began the invasion of Pearl Harbor. Everyone had to be someplace. I just happened to be there, said Stratton. He was only one of 334 survivors of the Arizona as he helped with the rescue efforts. After his injuries healed, he was discharged only to re-enlist two years later to serve two more terms in the United States Navy. According to Stars and Stripe, after his death in 2020, his family stated that he only had one wish, to have the memories of those of Pearl Harbor, to share the story, and to never forget. Share the story. Never forget. These individuals witnessed extraordinary events in our, our, our history. And just like Luke, Luke shared the stories of those witnesses that, that saw Christ in action. They saw him in person. They saw Jesus heal and teach. Luke talked to disciples. He talked to those who became his companions and closest friends. And Luke saw himself firsthand the journeys and the missions of one of the greatest teachers you could ever have met in Paul. What a fantastic testimony that Luke has for all of us to have that witness, to be led by the Holy Spirit, and to provide the stories that we all know and love and that we have faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you this morning for this wonderful time that you've given to us. And we want to thank you for Luke. We want to thank you for his testimony and, and you giving him the lead so we can learn about you. We thank you for his patience, his organization, his attention to detail as we learn more about, as we, as we use these stories to learn more about you. 
We thank you for that opportunity. In your name we pray. Amen.
his place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Lord, thank you so much for this morning, and thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for, thank you so much for to, to experience that. We thank you, Lord, for the, for the times that when we don't feel like you are close, Lord, we want to thank you for, for, for being there when we, are, when we need you most. Lord, be with us as we go through the rest of this week, as we go to our schools, we go to our jobs, and we're with our families, Lord. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory.